So next talk uh, is by, uh, okay, here it is. It's constructive hybrid games. Uh, the speaker is Brandon Bauer and it is, it's a joint paper with Andre Platzer. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Brandon Borer from Carnegie Mellon. I'm going to talk to you today about a constructive logic for hybrid games. Let's start with motivations. On the right, we have a cyber physical system. That is any physical system with a computer controlling it. There are many examples of this. For example, transportation systems, including almost any modern car, autonomous or not. On the left, we have some technologies for verifying these systems specifically differential dynamic logic, DL. The box modality, box AP, means that every behavior of system A satisfies post condition P. The diamond modality, diamond AP, says there exists a behavior of A that satisfies P. If you're familiar with Hoare logic, this is a lot like the partial and total correctness primitives in Hoare logic. This notation is just a different notation used by dynamic logics, of which game logics are one kind. Below that, we have pictures of hybrid systems dynamics. So we have continuous dynamics, typically a differential equation, and we also have discrete changes, and we also have non-determinism. The system might describe multiple possible options. However, these cyber-physical systems have some features that are not captured simply by hybrid systems. They often have an adversarial component. For example, we may have another car that's being driven by a demon. It may be driving in a way that we do not like or is even adversarial to our own. We also have some dynamics that are simply so complicated that it's easier to treat them as an adversary. For example, you may have an operating system on your car with a scheduler. It's not really an adversary, but it's easiest to model it as such because it is so complicated. You could even have a, a physical property that's best thought of as an adversary. There's probably going to be potholes on the road, and if you've ever driven a car, you know they're always in the worst possible place. So you might as well treat it as an adversary. Regardless of whether it's a true adversary or not, there's sort of this two-player back-and-forth dynamics. My opponent makes a move, and then I react. Now, you can do proofs about games, and this work does build on a classical game logic, DGL, differential game logic. And in that logic, we realize that boxes correspond to demons. So I cannot control my opponent, but rather I can establish some invariants that hold no matter what they do. I can describe the limits of my opponent's abilities. The diamond corresponds to the angel. It corresponds to my player. If I'm the one making decisions, then I can actually give a witness that says, what decision do I make in each case? One reason we studied constructive logic for hybrid games in this project is that previous work in our group has shown that connecting proofs to implementations is both important and difficult. One thing you might want to do is to take the content of your proofs and try and extract or synthesize code from it. And in previous works, even for classical proofs about systems, we've shown that you can take invariants and use this to get a monitor. I can use these invariants to check, does the implementation follow the assumptions that are in my model? If it does, that's great. It means the system is probably safe. If it's not following those assumptions, I might use some kind of fallback mechanism to try and make it safe once again. Our experience on these projects showed us that this would work better in the setting of games, where demon proofs allow us to talk about invariants and angel proofs allow us to talk about witnesses. Most importantly, games make it easy to switch between the two. So if you have a classical proof about angel, that means there exists a decision that controls the system safely. It doesn't tell you what that choice is. In this paper, we fix that by introducing constructive differential game logic, CDGL. We make sure that angelic proofs give you computable witnesses of Angel's decision. We now have that theoretical foundation, which could be used for synthesis tools that connect that proof with the implementation. The headline of this work is that there is a Curry-Howard isomorphism for hybrid games. So if you give me a constructive proof about a game, this corresponds to a computable strategy. And that computable strategy can be divided into monitoring and control. The monitor corresponds to proofs about my opponent, whereas the control corresponds to proof about myself. Let's move on to examples. Here is a syntax of a simple game example. Let's say I have a one-dimensional road, and I'm trying to tailgate the driver in front of me. Maybe it's some slow-moving truck, and I've got a fast-moving car. 
we also have some sort of timing dynamics. We can think of these, if we like, as being a third player, but in practice, we're going to think of this as being part of the demon player, or part of the truck, because it's opposing us. It is in coalition with the demon. How do we model the rules of this game? Well, the angel gets to pick any acceleration I want, but I have to prove that it's within the plus or minus three physical limits of my car. If it actually is within limits, it should be easy to prove. If it's not in limits, I will not be able to prove this. Next, I have two stages controlled by the demon. This postfix D represents demon or duality. It is the dual to my player. The demon gets a discrete choice represented by union, and this allows him to either set his speed to minus one or plus one. This is a little different from the angel player. I'm just doing this for the sake of an example. The physics is also controlled by the demon or by the environment. There's a local timer T that starts at zero and evolves at some unit rate. The distance between the cars and the trucks also evolves based on our relative velocity. But it only does this as long as some constraint holds. So demon must continuously prove at every point that the time does not exceed two. The ampersand represents that there is a constraint. After this, there's also a discrete test, which says that at the end, the time must be at least one. This is different from a continuous test because, of course, the time is not one at every point. Initially, it is less than one. That describes how to play one round of the game. But how do we play the repeated game? If I put a star at the end, that means that angel is controlling the duration. If I put a times, that means demon controls the duration. I also wanted to reflect for a moment what the strategy of this game would look like, even though I will not go into a full proof. In each round, Angel makes one choice, a choice of acceleration. And to do that, I'm going to need to look at the state. I'm going to need to determine, am I too close to my opponent? Am I too far? Am I just right? And that's what's going to come up when we look at proofs and when we look at semantics, is this idea that Angel has to inspect the state to decide what branch I'm going to take or what value to set for some variable x. Just keep that in mind. I described how we play the game, but now we should describe what the winning conditions are. We do this using the diamond and box modality that I showed you on the intro slide. These both mean that Angel has a winning strategy for game alpha. The difference is that diamond means Angel plays first, while box means demon plays first. A very natural property I might want to prove is some kind of safety, which says that if I let my opponent control the duration of the game, I can ensure that I never actually hit the opponent. My distance is always positive. I highly recommend proving this theorem, but it has very real limitations. To show you that, I'm going to give you an animation of a safe car. This is not a bug in my video. This is a safe car, right? So there's a saying, a ship in harbor is safe, but that is not what ships are built for. And the same thing goes for cars. I can be safe by simply doing nothing. This is a trivial solution, which satisfies the theorem, but does not at all get at the notion of correct control. To get around this, we might prove a second theorem. A second theorem might be liveness that says, I can eventually reach my goal, or I can get within some distance epsilon of the goal. Let's not worry exactly what that epsilon is. To do this, I need to be in control of the duration. I need to guarantee that I play long enough to actually get there. But this also has its own limitations. It shows liveness, but not safety. Right? I could floor the gas and just crash into the car in front of me. That's also not what I want. It's trivial in its own way. To synthesize these two ideas and to get around these trivial solutions, we use a kind of specification called reach avoid. It says we do eventually reach our goal, but we're also safe at every point in time. It's very subtle, but turn taking is essential to help us state this theorem. Demon gets to choose the duration of the differential equation inside of game, which is how he can force us to prove safety at every single time. If this is at all unclear, please ask questions during the Q&A. Reach avoid would also be a good basis for any synthesis or extraction tools based on Curry Hauer for games. Because we have one proof which captures safety and liveness, we also have one proof which captures both control information and monitoring information. Moreover, picking good models and theorem statements is often half the battle, and reach avoid helps us with that problem. Let's talk a bit about the foundations. That's it for the examples. 
The modalities diamond and box are the defining features of this logic, so we need to ask what these mean constructively, what it means to have a computable strategy. To overcome that challenge of making strategies constructive, we appeal to a type theoretic semantics and reuse notions of constructivity from type theory. Another subtlety that holds for any game logic is that they are in some ways stronger and in some ways weaker than logics of systems or logics of programs. Because you have duality and looping, you have very strong notions of quantifier alternation. And because of this, it is a subnormal logic. That simply means that you do not have Kripke's axiom K, which is certainly a foundational axiom for most modal logics. On the right, instead, we have a monotonicity rule that kind of takes its place. But the fact that you don't have the axiom K hints at this idea that our semantics will be a little bit different from your standard Kripke semantics. Speaking of proof rules, how do the other proof rules change when we make them constructive? Most of them change only in small ways. For most of them, the only change is that we need to phrase it as a constructive natural deduction calculus. That's great. We can reuse a lot of our knowledge of how to prove hybrid games. However, there are some very important changes. As we showed in the example, there is a lot of first order reasoning, arithmetic or algebraic reasoning, and this all has to be constructive now. You can do this, but there's very little in the way of automation compared to very good automation for classical arithmetic. So you have to be ready to do a bit more proofs yourself. We also lose the excluded middle. This is important because we need a case analysis rule any time that we're inspecting the state in a proof. Recall from our example that I might want to check how far I am from the car in front of me. We can do this, but we need to use a comparison with epsilon. I can't tell you if f and g are exactly the same. I can tell you if they're within some distance epsilon. Now let's take a look at the definition of the semantics. We're going to interpret formulas p as propositions over states in type theory. I'm going to give you a few selected cases of angel and demon for the sake of time. Each of these cases is going to be dual to one another. So if angel is playing a test, angel has to give you a pair both prove Q and prove the post condition P. If demon is playing, then my proof allows me to assume that demon has proven Q for me, and I use that to prove P. Assignments operate exactly like quantifiers, or like sigma and pi types. So if angel is playing, then I would choose the value of V that gets set to X, and then I prove P in the new state. If demon is playing, I give a function so that daemon can tell me v, and I have a uniform argument that p holds no matter what v is. If I'm playing a choice and angel is in control, this would be a disjunction. I have to give an injection that says, do I go to the left and prove p, or do I go to the right and prove p after playing beta? If daemon is in control, then I don't know whether I'll be playing alpha or playing beta. So I have to give a pair. I am prepared to play alpha, I am also prepared to play beta. Duality, as I have suggested, is implemented by switching diamonds and boxes. So an angelic way to play the duel of alpha is simply a demonic strategy for alpha. I did want to talk a bit about what constructivity means. This is known as the existential property, and please note that in this paper, existentials are defined as angelic diamond assignments. In any constructive logic, we have some of these lemmas that describe constructivity. And one of those properties is that if you prove an existential, if you know that an existential is true, then I can extract a term f that instantiates the existential. Sigma types give me this for free. I can take this from the inversion principle for sigmas. The same goes for disjunctive choices. Let's talk a bit about the proof rules. Again, this is a small selection of the rules. One very natural way to highlight the relationship between proofs and programs is to use natural deduction. Natural deduction always corresponds nicely to some kind of functional program. And we did implement a prototype that checks these proofs in Scala, but that's not a main point of the talk. I just wanted to mention it. Many of these rules look like natural deduction versions of rules that have been used before. If I have a sequential program, alpha beta, I would simply prove alpha and move beta to the post condition. After playing alpha, it should be true that playing beta will enable me to prove p. If I have an assignment, then I can simply replace the variable x with the assigned term f in the post condition. 
If I have a loop that's controlled by my opponent, then I don't get to pick how long this loop runs. I need to pick an invariant that works no matter how long we have to play the game. Call that invariant J, and once I've proven that it is an invariant, I can now guarantee that any post condition P that follows from J is allowable or is sound. There are rules for angelic loops. These are kind of termination arguments, but those are in the paper. There's kind of limited space here. And even though many of these rules are familiar, I do want to highlight that the proofs are entirely new because we're using an entirely new semantics. So there's still a lot that goes on behind the scenes. Those are some discrete cases. Let's also talk about constructive proofs for differential equations. Many of these are very similar to existing rules, and you can skim the rules if you'd like. But what's different is that we now needed to appeal to constructive analysis to show that these rules are actually sound. If you have a simple equation, like the one in my example, you can actually just replace it with its solution and prove that the post condition holds of that solution. Of course, you need to prove this at all times t, and when you prove it, you get to assume that the constraint holds not only at t, but at every time. Technically speaking, you could check that sol is really a solution by taking its derivative. However, we also want to know that solutions are unique. This requires the constructive picard lindelof theorem, which luckily has been proven in the literature. Next, we have invariant style reasoning. This is very important in practice because it works even for systems that do not have elementary closed form solution. Unlike our example, most systems will need this rule. The idea is that if you give me a region P, I can automatically come up with a formula P prime. And what P prime means is that you are moving towards the interior of the region, or it means that P is getting sort of more true over time. If it's initially true and it keeps getting more true over time, it would stand to reason that it is always true. This may seem like a very high level intuitive argument, but when you prove this sound, this actually boils down to a mean value theorem argument. And because we have a constructive mean value theorem, we can constructively prove this rule sound. The last rule is what I would call a differential cut. This allows you to state some lemma R and prove that R holds throughout your differential equation. Once you've proven it, you can add it to the constraint. This is like assuming that everything outside of R is simply impossible and cutting those states out of the region. There are some cases where you do need this because you cannot use simply one invariant. Constructively, all we needed to prove is that solutions are prefix closed. This is a very simple constructive proof and it actually suffices to show the couple. These rules and many more, including differential ghost variables that augment an ODE, and including variance principles for diamond invariant reasoning, all of these rules have been proven sound. So we've, t we've shown that if you give me natural deduction proof, I can give you an inhabitant of its corresponding type from the semantics. Let's start moving back towards the applied side by giving a big step operational semantics. We said in the intro that our ultimate goal is synthesis or extraction. Basically, that is a compiler from proofs to control and monitoring code. An excellent first step anytime you want a compiler is to write an interpreter. So we interpret an angel proof against a daemon environment. If you give me an angel who's playing game alpha with condition P and a daemon who's playing the same alpha, maybe with a different goal Q, our semantics will then compute the final state T and will actually prove that both of their goals hold in that state. This is a little bit subtle just because we're thinking of this as a non-cooperative game, but if their goals don't conflict, they can actually both meet their goal. In the test case, Angel would have to prove the test. Right? The test is R and the proof of that test is A. We'll see there's this kind of back and forth dynamics. Demon is expecting a proof of R, and so we play demon strategy by plugging in A and C on the right. This kind of back and forth is going to appear in every case. Because it's a test, we don't have to change the state, we just return the state S. In this way, the assignment case is different. Angel has to give a witness F saying how the state will change. Whereas again, demon is waiting for F and gives a lambda. We update the state S according to the new value of X, and then again, we plug in the value f into b's proof in order to play the demon strategy. Non-deterministic choices controlled by angel have two cases. 
if Angel chooses to go to the left, then we tell Demon that he has to play Alpha as well. He's given us B and C so that he can play either Alpha or Beta. If Angel wants to go to the right, then we simply tell Demon to play C instead. If we have a duality, this is very similar to the semantic description. An Angel strategy for a dual game is really just a Demon strategy for Alpha. So we just switch the position of Angel and Demon. The paper has all the cases for differential equations and loops, but the differential equation and assignment cases are a lot like the non-deterministic assignment, and the loops have a lot in common with choice. Not only does this give us a sense how to execute games, but it gives us some nice theorems as well. We can get a notion of what consistency means for this logic. In the sense that Angel plays Alpha and gets P, Demon cannot have a strategy for not P. If they did, we could derive falsehood. Not only would we derive falsehood in our logic, CDGL, we would derive falsehood in type theory, which we believe to be impossible. So this consistency theorem follows from consistency of type theory. In conclusion, today we developed a constructive logic of hybrid games. On the right, we have the motivations for that. We have all sorts of systems with physical hardware controlled by computers, and they operate in adversarial environments. So this combination of discrete, continuous, and adversarial works very well for these systems. On the left, we have logics for verifying these systems. There has been some work on game logics before. You can split this into safety-style reasoning about the demon and liveness or witness-style reasoning about the angel, but we realized that even the classical game logics were not quite enough. One reason they're not enough is that we would like to explore the relationship between proofs and implementations. We'd like to get actual executable code out of these proofs. Whenever you want to extract code from a proof, constructive logics are the way to go. And in doing this, we showed a notion of Curry-Howard isomorphism for hybrid games. A proof that you can win a hybrid game corresponds to a computable strategy to win the game. And that strategy corresponds both to monitor code, following the boxes and demons, as well as control code, following the diamonds and angels. We really like to emphasize that this Curry-Howard isomorphism can be studied for all sorts of program logics, any kind of horror logic, dynamic logic, or game logic. Basically, we want to study constructive proofs that talk about stateful imperative systems. This is slightly different from the use of a dependent type theory to write a functional program that is a correctness proof. While we started with synthesis as our motivation, I like to think of synthesis as the tip of an iceberg. And what this paper did was implement everything that is below the waterline. So we established foundations in type theory for our semantics. We showed the advantages of modeling with games. We gave an operational semantics that can interpret these proofs. Natural deduction gave us a nice calculus for these proofs, and some areas of constructive mathematics were really important for our soundness proofs. So constructive analysis allowed us to reason about differential equations, and constructive algebra gave us a way to understand the first order of reasoning that we do. If you'd like to hear more about these foundations, a lot of that is in the paper. But I would encourage you to read the paper and talk to me if you're interested in any of these parts, whether it's synthesis and extraction for cyber-physical systems, whether it's game logics, whether it's this idea of Curry-Howard isomorphisms for logics of programs. Thank you. I will now take any questions. I don't see here questions. <laughs> okay, so it seems that, uh, well, I mean, thank you very much. I, I don't see question in my, in my question and answer list. Hope. So.